Good evening and welcome. Special welcome to the folks who are watching at home. It's good for us to be together for worship. Some announcements as we begin. Our annual congregational meeting will be January 23rd at 11 o'clock. And for those who enjoy numbers and would like to look over the budget line by line, there will be a pre-meeting budget meeting next Sunday. That's January 16th. Uh, both of those will be at 11 o'clock, both of them up in the social hall. Committee night is this Thursday at 7 o'clock. We meet in the church basement for a short devotion and then break to do committee work. Even if you're not on a committee, we'd like to invite you to join us. We'll find a place to plug you in. The January newsletter is available to pick up at the church. Uh, it's inside the building and outside in the realtor box by the church office. You can also download a copy from the church website. If you would like to be on the USPS mail list, please contact the church office. Also, if you would like to be on the Monday morning email list, contact the church office for that as well. Our faith practice reading this past week was from Psalm 37. The psalm encourages patience and trusting in God to deal with the wicked. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. So in verse 27 and 28, the psalmist writes, Depart from evil and do good, so you shall abide forever. For the Lord loves what? What does the Lord love? Did anyone get that? Is anyone looking it up? Is Kennedy looking it up? No? Okay. Do you know? What's that? Well, yes, the Lord does love a cheerful giver, but that's not what this one says. <laughs> but you know what? I'll let you pick up the peanut butter cup anyway because they're from Halloween and they're probably... So take two peanut butter cups. The answer is the Lord loves justice for he will not forsake his faithful ones. Our readings each week are sequential, so this coming week will be in Psalm 38. Let us now begin our time of worship with song. Will you please stand? Yeah, 
Together, let us confess our sins. Most merciful God, we come needing your forgiveness. We turn our backs on your unconditional love. We allow the events of our daily lives to slowly and gradually cloud our awareness of you. We are more insensitive than we are rebellious. We are more wooden than we are alive. God, shake us up, turn us around, and give us a new energy to love and follow you. Hear the prayers of our hearts, God. Jesus promised he would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with those who believe in him. Through the waters of baptism, we are given a visual reminder of this great promise. Our sins have been washed away and we have been made clean. In the promise of baptism, we are reminded that we do not need to live our lives alone. We are reminded that we have a constant friend and a comforter in Jesus. Praise God for the new life we receive through baptism. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading comes from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my sight and honored, And I love you, and I give people in return for you, nations, in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I'm created for my glory, whom I'm formed and made. Here ends the first reading. The second reading comes from the eighth chapter of Acts. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Here ends the second reading. Spirit born of water and word, Spirit born that promises her the life that overflows with grace, is making me a child in this holy place. Spirit born in truth in my heart, Spirit born is where my life starts. Spirit born of water and word, Spirit born that promises her the life that overflows from grace. Make me a child in this holy place, Spirit born in truth in my heart. Spirit born is where my life starts. Will you please stand for the Gospel reading? The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, 
but the one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from the heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. This October, I will celebrate the 25th anniversary of my ordination, and I remember it like it was yesterday. No, not really. Time has a way of blurring memories. I remember that it was in my home congregation, Trinity Lutheran in Ashland, my first call was in northern Kentucky, and the Senate office is in Indianapolis. So we were planning and coordinating the ordination service across three different states. This was in the days before everyone was using email, so there were a lot of phone calls with planning hymns and planning scripture readings and scripture readers. I remember when Ralph Kemsky, he was the bishop of the Indiana-Kentucky Synod, when Bishop Kemsky would call and leave a message on my answering machine, he would refer to me as the almost Reverend O'Brien. That's because the ordination hadn't happened yet, but I told him that almost Reverend might be a fitting title after the ordination as well, but he didn't say that during the service. I remember that my parents and grandparents were there. A few people from my internship church in Van Wert were also there, which I thought was pretty cool. I hadn't been there for almost two years, so it was nice that they came to support me. And there were people who drove up from northern Kentucky. I expected some, but I remember being impressed on how many others made the three-hour drive from Crestview Hills up to Ashland. I remember the Gloria Day Council president being there, but as much as I rack my brain, I can't remember who else came. As I said, time has a way of blurring memories. I'm glad I have an old bulletin and pictures to look at to help refresh the blurry memories. So how about you? Do you remember the time you were ordained? You are, you know, ordained. You are a minister of the gospel. It happened at your baptism. You received the Holy Spirit and became a minister of the gospel on the day you were baptized. Cody Witt was scheduled to be baptized this weekend, but we had to reschedule because of COVID. But when we do reschedule, Cody will be made a minister of the gospel right here during worship. Now, most of us were probably infants when we were baptized, so we can't really remember like Cody will be able to being baptized as an adult. But maybe that's why we have confirmation at an age we can remember. By 13, we're able to remember the day the pastor lays hands on our head and speaks the same prayer about pouring out the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Sedona and Lindsay and Megan and Shane and Jacob, as I prayed last fall when we laid hands on the head of our confirmands. Do you remember a special day in your life when a pastor, perhaps others, laid their hands on you and prayed for the Holy Spirit? This was your ordaining, your calling, you're being set apart, empowered to be in ministry with Christ in the world. Unfortunately, most of us only associate being a minister or a priest with those who hold the title of 
pastor. Those who were ordained to word and sacrament ministry as I was 24 and a half years ago now. Over the course of time, we've lost Martin Luther's idea of the priesthood of all baptized Christians. Baptism has lost some of its significance as making of priests in the world. Instead, it's become only a rite of initiation into the church, or even just some magical right to get us into heaven somehow, like a holy fire insurance policy. This has led many to the unfortunate conclusion that pastors, those who are word and sacrament ordained, are the real ministers of the church. They're the ones, perhaps the only ones, who have the responsibility to share the gospel. The laity are just there to undergird and support the work of the pastors. This is very unfortunate because it's not at all what God intended. Going back to our gospel reading, when Jesus was baptized, Luke tells us the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and there was a voice proclaiming Jesus as the beloved Son of God. If we keep reading after today's selection ends, Luke tells us Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. So right after this event, right after the Holy Spirit, even before his extended stay in the desert, Jesus began his ministry of preaching, teaching, and healing, telling people that the kingdom of God is here. Luke joins with the other gospel writers in making the point that Jesus' baptism is the day of his ordination, the beginning point of his work, the beginning of his public ministry. The same is true for each of us, too. Now, we might be tempted to think Jesus is a special circumstance, but consider Luke's story of Jesus describes the Holy Spirit working long before that day Jesus is grown and beginning his ministry. Just a few weeks ago, we read the story of the angel's annunciation to Mary. Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. It seems the Holy Spirit descended on Mary first, and on that day, her ministry began. That day was the beginning of her work for God. Her being the mother of Jesus would be a ministry ordained by God. That day, Mary became the first in the story of Jesus to hear the call of God to receive the Holy Spirit and to say yes. Then in Luke's gospel, the Holy Spirit fell on Elizabeth when the child in her womb leapt when expecting Mary came near. Then the Holy Spirit fell on Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, and he prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. And the Holy Spirit rested on Simeon as he proclaimed the infant Jesus to be the Messiah, when Mary and Joseph brought him to the temple. Now, all of these are accounts from before Jesus' baptism. And after his baptism, the Holy Spirit continues to be active through Luke's gospel and in the book of Acts. From these Holy Spirit stories, I think we can draw a few conclusions. First, ministry is a gift of God. It's not our idea, it's God's idea. Mary didn't wake up one morning and decide she was going to bear the Son of God. The Holy Spirit came upon her and said, I have a job for you. Which leads to the second conclusion, ministry is a gift of God through the Holy Spirit. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came to the temple that day. Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke his prophecy. And us, when we are given the Spirit in baptism, not for some sort of personal comfort, 
though we might receive comfort from the Holy Spirit, but rather so that we might be empowered to participate fully in the ministry of Christ in the world, so that we might, in our own way, proclaim the good news of Jesus for all the people. Third, ministry is a gift of God through the Holy Spirit to all the baptized. Mary, Elizabeth, and the others predate baptism in the Gospels, of course, but notice the Holy Spirit wasn't reserved just for Jesus or just for the temple leaders. The Holy Spirit comes to a young single woman and to an older married woman. The Holy Spirit comes to a priest in the temple and to a man who has no other title except being someone who was righteous and devout. The point is, in just the first two chapters of Luke, the Holy Spirit comes to all sorts of people. And the Holy Spirit continues to come to all sorts of people today. There's a debate as to whether Martin Luther actually used the phrase priesthood of all believers. But he did repeatedly refer to baptized believers as priests. He firmly believed and taught that all believers, all of us, all who have faith in Christ and are baptized, all who have received the Holy Spirit, all are, des are de designated as priests and share in Christ's royal priesthood. This means that every believer has equal access to the Father through Jesus, and every believer has the responsibility to act as a priest to others, to minister to them, to attend to their needs, particularly through the proclaiming the love of God made known in Jesus. Yes, for the sake of the good order of the church, we have people we call pastors who are set apart and ordained word and sacrament ministers, but all of us who are baptized, who are ordained by God to be ministers. We pastors are only here to help the ministers do their ministry. We're here to do ministry with the baptized certainly not to do ministry for the baptized. Now, it may seem strange to think of yourself as being ordained, but I've seen you do ministry. I've seen evidence that you're ordained, gifted with the Holy Spirit for ministry. I've seen your ministry singing with the choir, or in a Sunday school classroom, or praying with the sick, or at a committee meeting. I've seen you ministering to the hungry and those in need. In times when a family is in crisis, I've seen and heard your concern, your prayers, your Christ-like love. I have seen you minister. So, maybe, in a way, I started my sermon all wrong. The day I was ordained, wasn't the evening of October 10th back in 1997 when Bishop Kemsky laid his hands on my head and made me a pastor. I was ordained as a minister one Sunday morning in 1970 when Pastor Kinsvater poured water on my head, signified that I had been claimed by God, given the Holy Spirit, and made a minister in Christ's church. How about you? Even if you don't have the word reverend in your title, or even almost reverend, as a baptized child of God, you have been given the Holy Spirit and ordained a minister. That's what we celebrate in baptism. So let's go be ministers. Let's use the gifts God has given us as a sign of the outbreaking of the kingdom of God. Let us attend to people's needs, love them, forgive them, tell them that they too are God's beloved. Each of us has been gifted by the Holy Spirit in baptism. Let's go be the ministers that God has called us and ordained us to be. Amen. 
Will you please stand for the affirmation of faith? I believe in a great God who created the world in power and love. God's character is reflected in all of creation and in his Son, Jesus Christ. His life, his teachings, his miracles, his death, and his resurrection provide true forgiveness of sin and life for all creation. His strength bolsters my weakness. His love covers my failures. His sacrifice forgives my sin. I trust him as a friend and a brother. I believe in the Holy Spirit, God at work in and among us. I believe God is present and active in today's world, and I can know God's joy in this life and in the age to come. I believe the Church of Christ is the people of God. I can experience true meaning and everlasting love in my life through prayer, the sacraments, and the community of the Church. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the Church, the world, and all that God has made. By the Holy Spirit, you gather your church and send it out in mission to share the good news of Jesus. Inspire your faithful people to be fervent in prayer and service, that all people know they are precious in God's sight. God of grace, hear our prayer. You reveal your love and power through water and the Spirit. Guard rivers, seas, and all bodies of water from destruction and pollution. Secure access to clean water for all, and protect the land from drought and flood. God of grace, hear our prayer. Establish among the nations the blessings of peace. Raise up leaders who will protect vulnerable people in their care. Strengthen advocates who risk repudiation or retaliation for the sake of mercy and justice. God of grace, hear our prayer. You protect us through the fires and troubled waters of this life. Assure us that we will not be cut off from you by illness or despair, anxiety or pain, confusion or weakness. Comfort all who are in need. Today we pray especially for Audrey, Marilyn and Luann, Joe, Jeanette and Riley, for Pat, Mark, David, Ron, Jean, and all of those we name before you now. God of grace, hear our prayer. We are joined in baptism to Christ and to one another. Bless those who are newly baptized and those who are preparing for baptism. Help us to be faithful in fellowship, worship, evangelism, service, and love. God of grace, hear our prayer. You created each of your saints for glory. We give thanks for those you have called by name and to your eternal embrace. Comfort us in grief and release us from fear. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. We're not passing the offering plates, but we're still pausing in our time of worship to remember the importance of giving in our spiritual lives. Giving of ourselves, our time, and our possessions is an important part of our faith. So whether we give in the offering plate by the door or online giving or mailing in a check or some other way, the important thing is not the method, but rather that we joyfully offer what we have to God as a sign of thanksgiving and as a sign of faith. Let us join in our offering prayer. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. 
Lead us to your table. Nourish us with this heavenly food and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ our light, amen. As we gather to celebrate this holy meal, we remember Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Anyone who eats this bread will never be hungry. And Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his friends, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Jesus said, I am the water of life, springing up to life eternal. And Jesus took a cup, gave thanks, and shared it with all of his friends, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is the new covenant in my blood, established between us forever. Jesus is the living bread which came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup proclaims the Lord's death until he comes again. Those who eat this bread will have life in them, for the bread which Jesus gave for the life of the world is his flesh. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your grace. Send us to send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthen us with the riches of your grace. In your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forevermore. Amen. A future. I have a future. God has a plan for me. In this I'm sure. In this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your home. Is faithful. Your word is faithful. Mighty in power. Mighty in power. God will deliver me. Of this I'm sure. Of this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. Go with Christ into a weary world. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. God's peace, everyone. Have a blessed week.